and as well as um, uh, others in the room. So it, it certainly uh, was wonderful to see him uh, fill it up. And uh, so, uh, Dwayne Cecil, if you pray for him, um, rehab from the uh, heart attack and the, and the surgery that he had. And of course, Ruth, um, Ron sent me a message yesterday. I think he's been having family drop by to keep him company, do things. I think he's wearing him out, maybe. I don't know. Uh, he said, I'm just, I miss Ruth. He's looking forward to her being back. So uh, she does plan to come here in a few weeks, um, maybe about two weeks to be back. Um, but we're praying for our son to be, um, come to a place where he can receive a, a liver transplant, for essentially. It's a significant prayer request um, and, and great need there. So um, keep praying for that. With that, let's just take uh, a second uh, to prepare our hearts for work. One thing that's not showing up in uh, the order of service this morning, our special music that will follow right behind the uh, second hymn, the middle hymn there, is uh, Lily Hines going to share with us, It Is Well With My Soul, here in just, just a little bit. So we thank you, Lily, for your willingness to do that today. Let's take a second to prepare our hearts for worship.
that's wanting to acknowledge you as the great King of Heaven, the great Creator and Sustainer of all things, and we glory in you who has created us in your image. We come also to confess that uh, we recognize that we have sinned and we have um, fallen. And uh, we would pray that you uh, remind us today of our restoration in Jesus Christ who came to rescue us, to lift us up out of the effects, the guilt, the consequence of the sin uh, that we have enacted uh, that has had power over us. And we would pray that you renew us in that today. Our hearts will be renewed and strengthened in Christ. We will know that we have met with the living and true God this day, and our hearts have been uh, encouraged in Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. Accept our worship. Enable us by the Holy Spirit today to, as we open our mouths to praise you and to profess our faith, and as we bow our heads in prayer, that everything we do will be fitting and appropriate to our great King and Sovereign Lord. We lift all this up and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the back of the hymnal, page nine, uh, 872, there are a couple of categories of questions that I want to use as our confession of faith. And by a couple, I mean four. <coughs> These are the questions in the shorter catechism that, in, that introduce and prepare us to go through the um, Commandments, the Ten Commandments, and the teachings there. And so, uh, verse or, or question thirty-nine is where we'll start. We'll do thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, and forty-two. Okay. These are the preparatory questions before the content of the commandments are covered through the catechism. Um, perhaps you'll see a little later when uh, why I would choose these today. What I will do is I'll read the questions. We'll together read the answers, and in so doing, we will be confessing our faith together. So let us do that. What is the duty which God required of man? The duty which God required of man is obedience to his revealed will. What did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. Wherein is the moral law summarily comprehended? The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. What is the sum of the Ten Commandments? The sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord your God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind, and our neighbor as our son. Amen. Please be seated. Um, a little later, we'll look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. And in that, in that verse, you see this transition of, uh, of realizing that um, what we believe um, affects a way of life. It affects our lives before God. And um, so I'll hear more about that. And in essence, those questions and answers sort of bring that to the, to the forefront, that there is a, uh, an expectation uh, of God's revealed will in the law. And really throughout the scriptures, there's a revelation of that. And um, our lives are to be devoted to that. Um, so the scripture reading if we use the Pew Bible, we'll have a common text. I think we'll be able to do this responsibly because the numbers remain aligned on the left. But it's page 957 in the Pew Bible. And it's in Psalm 119. If you know anything about Psalm 119, if you keep flipping there, you'll see it's up. It carries on for a while. Um, the longest psalm and there are eight verses attached to a heading that correspond to the letters. They're really not called letters, but you call radicals. The, the letters or radicals of the Hebrew alphabet. We're, we're just going to go through the first eight. The entire, entirety of Psalm 119 is really uh, 
the, the theme is God's revealed word. Uh, it's Torah. Uh, there's various sorts of statutes, decrees, commands. I mean, there's all sorts of words used. But essentially, it's all the ways in which God makes the word known. And the expressions of the blessedness of it, uh, aspects of applying the word, learning the word, memorizing the word, etc., and the effects of that, the fruit of that, the love of God's word. So, what we'll do, you'll see all the numbers line up there on the left. Uh, we'll read responsibly. I'll go one, you follow two, etc., until we can. So, let us uh, look here, give attention to the word of God in Psalm 119. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed, Blessed are they who teach his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong, they walk in his ways. You may have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all of your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. The Lord has blessing to the reading. In the understanding, the application, may we make these kind of, uh, have in our hearts this kind of um, desire for the word of God. Psalm 119. By um, the expressions there of what's uh, what's being said about the word, the Torah, the law, the revealed word, could be um, summarized, or shall I use the words of the uh, catechism, summarily comprehended, uh, I like those fancy expressions. Uh, it could be summarized in that expression in Psalm 1 that says, His, that is the righteous man, His delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And I pray that we will always have that delight of God's revealed word and uh, devote ourselves to studying and learning it. Well, the word written is beautiful and the word incarnate is wonderful. And we're going to sing of that. A wonderful Savior. Of course, the essence of that word is to lead us to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Savior of sinners, the one who has come to uh, redeem us and to reconcile us to God. On 175, you will flip over there, you can remain seated. We're going to sing of this uh, wonderful Savior, wonderful Savior Jesus Bible, 175.
uh, I'll give you a little background. She sang this. Um, is it is a competition? You all get together. Some of the schools get together and they have different things. And somebody recorded it and put it out on social media. Did you record that, Justin? Or did somebody, somebody recorded it out? And um, we've seen it. And Nancy saw it. Said, "Hey, we need to get, get her to sing that here." To her. It's a pretty rendition of uh, it as well. Uh, with my soul, we thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. so much for doing that today. <clears throat> um, let us uh, turn to the Lord and turn lifting up our, lifting up our uh, concerns to Him. Lord, we, uh, we thank You. Um, we thank You for the ways in which You watch over us that in Christ uh, we may echo those words. It is well with our soul. We pray that that will, in fact, be the experience of our hearts. 
we will feel the confidence and the love and the assurance of your great care over us at all times. Especially when life hurts, when it's hard, when it's disappointing, when it's scary. We pray that you come along and take hold of us and lift us up in your care. We have members of the church and people we care about who we're we are praying for at this time, and we would ask that you especially watch over them. Enable us as we are able to offer words of encouragement, offer tangible assistance in ministry to them when we have opportunity, and use that uh, to show your goodness and your care uh, for your people. We uh, today will lift up to you uh, Paul Nolan and Steve's brother and continue to lift him up and ask your healing <clears throat> on his body. Uh, we would pray that you would restore him to strength and give him uh, greater stamina and uh, endurance as he um, manages uh, during this time, this period uh, with this illness. Uh, we're grateful that you have blessed him so much. You've been able to lead a relatively normal life even while suffering many symptoms and side effects. But um, at this time, it's been very difficult, uh, not only for him, but his wife and for the rest of the family there's anxiety so we would pray that at this time where things are uncertain and delicate and uncomfortable that your presence and your care would be very especially known to them and that they may lean on you and know you and be comforted by the presence of your spirit at this time we also will lift up to you Ruth as she is with her son in California and we would ask that, that you uh, enable her uh, to minister well and serve well um, uh, the son that she loves. We would also pray for him that you would uh, touch and heal his body, that you would allow his liver to function uh, well enough that there would be uh, approval uh, to move forward with this transplant. And we would pray that you would provide for him for that. Um, and I pray that your presence would be there with him. That this experience not only be about medical care and progress, uh, but it would be a, an opportunity and a time uh, for uh, them to look to you and to trust in you and to seek you. So, Lord, make that uh, happen in Luke's life and in Ruth as she is there to help. I want to pray for the way and ask that you continue to strengthen him, help him to take full advantage of progress through his rehabilitation and uh, that you, you would also protect him from further incident um, that's related to these uh, disease processes and uh, bless their family, provide for them uh, what they need at this time. Um, we also we give praise and thanks to you uh, for the ways in which you have worked and brought about through your body care as the good shepherd you have uh, seen us through and we especially praise you for how uh, Kent has bounced back from his illness and, and uh, dealing with those seizures again we pray that you'll sustain him and keep him and uh, help uh, Donald Russell and, and others as they support him in this and uh, we, we, but we give thanks that you saw him through some really scary things and you have uh, seen him through this uh, to this point where he seems to be uh, much better and, uh, and, and energetic and uh, we'd love to see that so we lift these things up to you we have many others we have constant concerns we have we know people or our families or we ourselves are still grieving uh, loss of loved ones we uh, uh, we need you in those situations we need you to come to us and bring comfort we need you to be with those people who hurt feel that deep sense of loss and losing their loved ones. And we pray that you care for them as well. Lord, we also pray for your ongoing work of sanctification in our lives uh, to equip us and to, um, uh, and to raise us up and grow us up in Christ that wherever we go, whatever we do, it would be uh, of great um, significance to, uh, to show Christ to our world. And uh, whether that's through speaking a word, a direct teaching or exhortation from your word, or if that's um, 
the, the, the example that we said, we pray that our whole lives would be uh, in service to you. That you would, in fact, make us ambassadors of Christ, representatives uh, for him wherever we go. We pray for a revival in our day, the powerful sweeping movement of the Spirit that comes upon uh, large numbers and turns their hearts from the darkness of their sin and destruction of a very difficult uh, lifestyle and turns them to you in Christ. That they find redemption, they find transformation and wholeness, and that um, they may enjoy the blessedness of this gospel that we have. Um, we long for that and we pray for that even now. Help us to do our part teaching, proclaiming, and living faithfully for Christ in our particular places. Um, Lord, we, uh, we, we pray that we, as a church body, and that your church everywhere would be an effective, um, uh, an effective instrument for the gospel. Make our ministries effective to teach, preach, apply the word. Um, we would pray that to um, we, we long for the opportunity to reach more people, but we trust that that's in your hands. You should, and we ask that you would, uh, add to our numbers here as you will. But build us up as a strong and solid church, faithful to your work, um, using our gifts to encourage one another day by day in faithful service to you. We do love you. Thank you. For that ongoing work in our life. We do pray for matters around the world, especially the conflicts and the devastation. We would pray that you would bring this thing in Ukraine to an end, that you would thwart the efforts of attack and destruction uh, by the Russians. And um, that's, not to, that's not to make any claim over any authority in the civil uh, and political realms. We just, we just know this is devastating and hard. And it is, it is causing many people to suffer. And uh, so we would pray that you would sovereignly rule and uh, bring about righteousness and peace and justice in your way. Uh, enable your people and churches in those areas who uh, are helping refugees and those who are vulnerable to, um, to be supported, encouraged, and remain faithful to Christ. We... Uh, pray that you would just uh, be present in that situation. We do love you and thank you for every good thing we have in Christ. We, we pray that you would strengthen us and carry us on as your people, that we may serve you well, glorify you in all that we do. We lift all these things up to you and pray in and through Christ our Lord. Amen. As the ushers come this morning, if you take the hymnal, how about we sing verses 1 and 4 of 134. God will take care of you. 134. <laughs>
doxology. Together, um, there was uh, propitiation, that idea of something that renders something propitious. That really settles it, doesn't it? Um, uh, what does that mean? It means to fully satisfy the wrath. Uh, we believe what Christ did wasn't just to cover or put aside sin, but it actually fully satisfied all that it deserved. And then, of course, there was the uh, idea of uh, covenant that we looked at happening. As well. And of course, last week looked at um, with it being Mother's Day and all that. However, I sort of began to, I've had some ideas through the year of where we, what we might look at and study. And uh, it struck me as we were coming out of that, I thought, I believe turning to something uh, kind of practical may be a nice change. Well, this is more of a transitional sermon, trying to show to you uh, as. Somebody on the seminary once said, said, why do we call that department over there practical theology? All theology is practical. In other words, you know, they, they don't even claim some exclusive thing. Now there's a, I think they've now changed it. They don't call it practical theology. They call it pastoral theology. You know, the things that you do in ministry as you apply uh, the scripture and the teachings of scripture. Uh, but uh, maybe that's because the systematic theologians fussed long enough to, get them to change that. And it is true, though. They're right. It may not readily be apparent, but all theology is practical, meaning it has application in the lives of men and women and in the lives of, 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 of God's people. Okay, so what, what am I going with this? We'll, we'll get there. Let me, let me uh, before I take off, let me, let's turn to the text. I'm going to read these two verses here, Romans 12, the first two verses, and then we'll... Uh, Take a look and see what is being said here. Give attention. Word of the Lord, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's 
will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the Lord has blessed the reading, the understanding application of this portion of his word. So, all theology is practical. Those doctrinal statements, those theological propositions that we can derive from Scripture, those really high uh, statements of Scripture that tell us something about God, about us as His cre creatures in His image, and, and about uh, our condition and our relationship, either whether it's good or separated by sin. Uh, those clear teachings about um, what God has done in doing something about our distance, our alienation from God due to sin, in sending the Lord Jesus Christ, and those things that are revealed about who Christ is, his person, we say, or what he has done, his work uh, in saving us and fulfilling what God planned to do. And then, of course, those teachings about how uh, what he has done comes to us and we receive it and, it ha and the effects that it has in our lives. And, of course, those glorious things about what we're to expect in the future in terms of the future glory and full salvation. Uh, I've just kind of done a quick sort of systematic theologian would break up all those things. They have they have theological heads, you know, theology proper and anthropology about man, and then of course uh, doctrines of sin. Of course, the doctrines of Christ or Christology is what Christ, the person, the work of Christ, and then of course the soteriology, the doctrines of salvation, how His salvation comes to us, and of course eschatology is the study of the end, the fullness of that being applied. All those statements, when studied properly, ought to lead us to a place where we can, even if we can't find it directly in Scripture, we can derive an application that has a bearing on our everyday lives. The reason I wanted to go to Romans 12, 1 and 2 is that you see that kind of thing uh, really happening as Paul is writing this. If it's not the grandest of the epistles, Okay, my, my, my Pauline theology professor, uh, the late Dr. Knox Chamlin, thought Ephesians was the highlight. Romans is obviously much larger and bigger, and it's right there, but he, he felt like Ephesians being more concise than how it goes was, was actually the highlight of, of Paul's writings. But that Romans clearly, its length, its, its depth, and, and all the things is a, is a, is a significant uh, writing uh, for him. They all have their significance, and have their, but, but because of its length and its significance, obviously going to the Roman Christians in the, the great capital of the Roman Empire and that sort of thing would have, would have had a significance for it. And so we're in this very uh, marvelous epistle of the great uh, Apostle Paul writing to these Christians, and we get in chapter 12, and it starts with this, therefore, okay, there, why, why would anything start with therefore? It's because... Um, there's something that came before it that we needed to have, have in mind before we move forward. But then it's also, therefore, this, then, and, you, and then you have to look forward. So there's a transition right here. Here's a hinge. There's something hanging and swinging on this side. Or there's something swinging on this side that we have to look at. And really in, the, in this verse, you see uh, something of the because of these things that I've already told you about who God is, what he has done, and what he has done in Christ Jesus Here's how you ought to live. Really, all Paul's epistles operate this way. Um, also, the late Dr. Knox Chamlin said, this first, the first part of Paul's epistles are declarative. He's telling you, he's just declaring who God is and what he's done in Christ. And then there's a point where it changes. Now, as a result of that, here's how you are to live. Here are the things you're to devote yourselves to. And in Romans, interestingly enough, there are some hortatory, that's what you refer to those things, uh, command, exhortation, hortatory sections. Uh, there are some things prior to this, but this is where it's very clear. Therefore, therefore, and he's saying, he's told all these things. For 11 chapters in Romans, God has been continuing uh, through Paul, has been saying, here's what I have done for you. Here's how I am responding to the problem of sin 
and the separation of my creatures from me. Okay? God, through Paul, Paul's obviously writing about how God has done that. So, we get to this place, we look back. Now, why, why am I saying that? Okay, for several weeks, I just over and over again <clears throat> came in here and gave you a sermon about some aspect to try to highlight the significance, the breadth, the various ways that Christ's death, and it's not only his death, his death was central, you know, the resurrection was related to it and part of it as well. How this atonement, these declarative, proclaimed truths of Scripture about what Christ has done now, let's reflect on those things and see if it doesn't lead us into things we need to think about about leading our lives faithfully before God. Throughout the scriptures, even the, de the declared doctrinal truths have an application in our lives of how we live. So yes, all theology is practical. Sometimes you have to dig in and study to figure what that act is. By the way, the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments did not start. I mean, the commandments do. But that's not the first thing God said. The commandments follow a preamble in which he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See that? Here's what I have done for you. Now, here's what you're to devote yourself to. Even the Ten Commandments are not just commandments. They are commandments to a way of life for the God who is and who has acted in redeeming them for himself. See that? God has acted. He's done. Here's what we can say about that. That's the theology. Now, here's what life should be like as those who are his. All right. Starts with this. Let's start with the therefore in view of God's mercy section. Okay, there you go. In view of God's mercy. Where do we see that? Well, probably if, if I really was going to do this well, I was writing a book on it, a thick, thick commentary on it at the point. I said, let's review what was said in the first 11 chapters. Let's highlight all the things to that. But I can't, I don't have time for that. You're going to get hungry in a minute if you're not already. And, uh, you're going to tune me out if I, if I try to go through all that. But let me at least point out a few things. It starts with Paul saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. You get the theme of this book right out of the gate. Gospel. It is the gospel. It is the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it is for salvation for all who believe. Um, so what, what has God done? He has brought salvation. He has brought redemption in Christ. Uh, you get in there, and even though uh, chapters 2 and 3 make really clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, okay, which is the statement in chapter 3, 23, or if you wanted to back up to chapter 3, verse 10, it says, no one is righteous, not even one. Of course, that's just quoting from Isaiah. Okay, So this sin problem, this alienation for God, is not something that just came on the scene in the first century. It was, it was well, we know it's been... It's been the problem since the beginning, right? Soon after the creation of Adam and Eve and their, their rebellious sin against this command of God. So that even though we're, everybody is flat, okay, everybody is humbled, the Jew and the Gentile, okay, he made sure both understood your sinners and your need of salvation. We get to this marvelous section in chapter 3. But now a righteousness from God has been, apart from all, has been made known. To which the law of the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now we, we looked at some of those verses when I covered some of the atonement stuff. But then you keep going, he says... Who put him forth as a propitiation. Okay? And, and I don't you know what propitiation means now. He was put forward to pay the penalty for our sins. To fully satisfy the wrath of God against sin. In order to justify. And to be the one who, 
who to be just and the one who justifies those who are in Christ Jesus. Then continues on talking about how faith is the is the instrument of our justification. That's that's a that's a phrase that systematic theologians would use. But even in chapter four, he shows even from the day of Abraham, it's clear God has made known. How are you considered righteous in God's eyes? It's not by doing something. It's not by performing anything. It is by faith. And Abraham is the example of that. Paul was making the argument for Romans 4. Faith is the mechanism of salvation. It's the thing that gets us in which we receive it. And Abraham was the example of that throughout the scriptures. Then we get into chapter 5. And more of what God has done. Okay, we're I'm recounting what Paul is meaning when he says, in view of God's mercies. Before he starts telling them what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to live. In view of God's mercies. The righteousness is given by God through Christ, who was put forward as a propitiation, etc. Chapter 5, we see this justifying um, blessing of Therefore, just as sin entered the world, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back up to the first verse. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The justification is the process by which we are brought into a right relationship. We are declared righteous in God's sight. And that results in peace with God. We looked at that section back when we talked about reconciliation. So it goes on. In chapter 6, we're told we're not left alone, but we've been uh, we have we've not only died with him, but we've been raised with him. And we anticipate resurrection in him. But really, chapter 6 is talking about resurrection is actually active and applied to us even now. We have new life in him. Chapter 7, yes, it's still a struggle with sin, but um, God is faithful to help you endure. In chapter 8, as I said, numerous occasions. You're not going to find anything more um, affirming and uh, helpful in gaining confidence and assurance than Romans 8. There's many other places to find stuff like that, but Romans 8 is not going to surpass Romans 8, which ends, which ends with nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's who God is. It's what he's done in Christ. And Paul spends all this time affirming it. Now, chapter 9, 10, and 11, there's some pretty complex and deep stuff about how it relates to God's uh, calling of Israel, how that relates, what's going on there, etc. But nevertheless, what is in view there is a glorious grace and mercy that is still evident that is now extended to the Gentiles, but is still there and still relevant for Israel, for those descendants of Abraham and Abraham. Then we get to chapter 12. In other words, 11 chapters of Paul telling them of the sovereign creator God of heaven who made us in his image and we rebelled in sin, all that he's done to take care of that and to bring us redemption and salvation in Christ. That's what he means by in view of God's mercies. In view, uh, in view of God's mercy. A lot of theology. The systematic theology books have countless citations from Romans 1 through 11 to say, here's what the Bible reveals about what God has done for you. In view of what God has done for you, then our duty, our obedience, our life of commitment to, to, to God through Christ, enabled by the Holy Spirit, is grounded in all that He has done for us. Then it says what? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. See that? In view of what he's done, give yourself to him. That's, that's really the essence of this. 
Yeah, don't don't separate. I, I may make a link available to you or, or provide it um, so that you can go back and listen to the one in 2018 um, sermon. Uh, what uh, li living sacrifices look like. And uh, so I'll do that and, and give you a little more. But the uh, the uh, it's not it's not simply uh, referring to the body here is referred not just simply to the physical body and action, but it's, it's really a way of saying your, your whole self. Give yourself to Him, and giving yourself to Him will result not only in things you think and feel and the motives of your heart, but it will result in you con conducting your life in a certain way. And so the so the body's going to be active and carrying that out. That's where it's going um, with that. God has done all this for you. Now you give yourself to him. Offer your bodies to living sacrifice. Okay? In that sermon for 2018, I make the distinction. This is a living sacrifice. In living, in carrying out a life devoted to God, in contrast to what? The old dead sacrifice, the, the killing of an animal, the shedding of blood. Uh, two different things. We're called to a living sacrifice. Like a life devoted to God. In Christ. Enabled and equipped and guided by the Holy Spirit. Based on what he's done. Now, also uh, uh, something you would uh, probably see in all of Paul's epistles, as he moves into those sections where he's teaching us how to live and what to do, many of them we could identify with the commandments of the Old Testament or other other uh, uh, you know moral teachings and such. But what will happen is uh, in this one in particular, probably the rest the rest of the um, epistle here. Is really giving us details of how we're to do this. In the sermon in 2018, I just looked, I went down to verse 9 and read what was there for several verses and showed you how that section gave us some details of how to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. But it's not just 9 through whatever, 9 through 21 that does it, it's the rest of the epistle. He, he lays before us. The principle, the broad teaching, in view of all that God's done for you in Christ, sending him to be your Savior, justifying you, reconciling you to himself in Christ, off your body as a living sacrifice. Okay, well, what does that mean? He gives us several chapters of specific instructions on how that's supposed to go. Submission to authorities in chapter 13. When I prayed the other week, and I'll reiterate this. I believe it to be true, although some of you may have to rebuke me if I if you hear me fussing and complaining about the government and all this sort of thing. Um, we're, never, we're, never, we're never given uh, an instruction or a right in the scriptures to fuss and complain and condemn the governing authorities. Now I'm not saying it's you know, you know, it's it's not that there's not an appropriate time to assess and and discuss and to identify the ways in which those things may be wrong. However, instead of instead of calling us to a place of you know complaint and such, we're always told to submit, be good citizens. So in every part of our lives, whether it's religious or whether it's entirely unreligious, un and just the way we go about our lives in the society, we are being exemplary citizens. Submit the authorities, chapter three. And also, we're told to pray for them. Those are the two things that are most in the forefront when it's talking about that. And you know, one of the first things somebody said, yeah, but I don't, I don't think Paul understood what life would be like. How the government and all the people in authority now just disregard our Christian truth and they just, you know, they don't believe anything the Bible says anymore. And like, do you understand which government was in charge when they wrote these things? The Roman Empire, those Caesars, who themselves were viewed and understood themselves to be divine, who demanded at least cursory or uh, you know incense to be burned to them, and many of our brothers and sisters in Christ were put to death because they refused to do that in those days. And some of them were deranged and crazy and, and put many Christians to death. Nero and, and uh, the mission and some of those. They understood. They, were, they, they, they weren't naive. So I always say that. 
to point out to I believe, obviously, we have, there's this temptation and pull for Christians. When we see widely unbiblical, a uh, disregard for biblical truth, a, a, a movement in there is to, is to want to, you know, first get angry, okay, and there's a righteous indignation that's appropriate. But is our response to that? Um, are we just going to start more arguments? Are we going to get in our holy huddles and fuss and complain? Are we going to do what God says? If, if, we, if we do that, then let's not, at least let's not disregard what he said. And that is we still have to be exemplary citizens. The nice thing in our system is, is that we can still participate. We can write letters. We can communicate our desires to our lawmakers, etc. And my guess is most of the time when there's a lot of fussing, when I, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I've complained about things and realized, you know what, I've never let my representatives know how I feel about it. The moment you feel like you've got to complain, put down a thoughtful letter. Send it to your, your representatives. Send it to the White House. Or the governor's mansion, or wherever we go. I don't know. Submit. The, okay, there's an example. I, I'm getting carried away with that. Don't lose heart in times when we see a widespread rejection. Here's, here's an interesting thing. I know I would rather see, I would rather see the gospel gradually take hold and widely just spread and take, you know, change hearts and the society as a whole. And I'm, I'm praying for that. I don't know if you picked up on that for a few years. Every pastoral prayer, praying for the Holy Spirit to move in a great awakening and a revival and everything. I'm predominantly wanting to see, to see lives redeemed from the destructive things that they're suffering from. It is heartbreaking to see families and wives and kids having to live in the mess that they're in. Usually, in history, the gospel of the kingdom is advanced not when there is this support and push from the civil realm, but when there's actually degradation and resistance even. Sometimes even persecution. I would love for that all to move in our direction. I, that just came from the, I, I'm thinking of So don't lose heart. I think that's why we're told to earnestly pray. Keep praying. Keep praying. Lift them up. Be good citizens. Well, it keeps going. In chapter 14, this discussion of the weak and the strong, you are to conduct yourself, and you're to be noticing everything. How it not only affects you, we talked about some of this just before we left our Sunday school class, the weak and the strong, the weaker, the one with the more restrictive uh, life and view on things, that more things, they want to avoid more things, and the one that's strong, and I, and I, and I, I hesitate, I don't encourage you to read that as weak and strong, and better or worse, that's not it. The weaker means a more tender conscience about things. One is stronger in the sense of having a little bit, feeling a little more freedom, that it doesn't burden their conscience in certain behavior. But the strong person is supposed to relinquish that right to do those things if he thinks that is going to destroy his brother. Yeah, I can eat meat sacrificed to idols. That's the first Corinthians passage. Yes, I can do that. Yes, I, I feel freedom to do that. I'm not, it's not out of control, it's not disproportionate, but, and I give thanks to God for it. But then somebody comes along and says, you know, I don't do that. That's, I believe that's a real detriment to my Christian life. But you know what? The one who's strong needs to be free from doing it in order not to, not to do anything regarding that. So there's another example. How do you offer your body to look yourself? Well, sometimes you might want to uh, refrain from this thing for the benefit of your brother instead of asserting your freedom to do it. It keeps going. So there's, there's various examples. Of course, love is talked about there. And in the section at the end of 12 and even into 13, agape love. Giving of yourself to somebody else. That's Christian love. There's also a philos, a family love for the brethren that's also mentioned in that section as well. But it's uh, the, the theology of all that God's done for us is practical. It turns into practice and conduct of life glorify God out of gratitude for all that he's done. And there's various ways we must devote ourselves to it. So this is a transition. And for a while, we're going to do some sermons that are very practical in nature. But as we talk about the practice, how we're to do things, what we're to do, what we're to 
aim to do and accomplish and pray the Lord will help us do. In practical terms, we also want to know the reason. It's because God has done so much for us in Christ. All theology is practical. So let us offer our bodies, in view of God's mercies, offer our bodies in living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the end. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, let's sing let's sing a prayer to the Lord. Take my life and let it be. Consecrate the Lord to the 585, standing together. Um, one and six. Let's stand together. One and six. As we do. Thank you.